Good evening, everybody. Myself, Dr. Saurabh Gupta, and I will be discussing today uh, acute kidney injury in uh, children. So, acute kidney injury in children is actually a relatively neglected top topic by both the pediatric community as well as the nephrology community. Uh, so, I'll be trying to, but over the last one decade, uh, this has got more attention in uh, clinically as well as in the research field. I'll be trying to uh, go go over uh, acute kidney injury with the following heading that uh, what exactly it is and what are its causes, risk, how to diagnose, manage, prevent, and when to do intervene. So uh, uh, description of uh, AKI. So basically, it uh, 200 years back, uh, William uh, Hedenberg gave the term, gave the term ischemia renalis. It is less like ischemia. Schema means decrease in blood flow. So, ischemia decrease in urine flow uh, was described. Uh, and um, William Osler, the father of medicine, he actually coined the term acute bright disease for acute kidney injury of any etiology. And Mr. Bright is the father of nephrology. So, between the two world wars, the term ARF, acute renal failure, entered the taxonomy. And it basically was a need of dialysis in acute settings. So it was a very narrow uh, diagnosis and it was a counterpart of CRF. But gradually over a period of time, our entire spectrum of acute kidney injury with even minor change in renal function to uh, even uh, till the requirement of renal replacement therapy uh, was uh, introduced. So why it was introduced? Uh, so mainly post-cardiac surgery patients and adults, they studied that even a change of 0.3 uh, it affects the outcome in form of mortality, length of stay, and cost of treatment. Most of this patient had multi-organ dysfunction and poor cardiac function. But this 0.3 figure, that is increase in creatinine by even 0.3 is significant, came from these retrospective data. Gradually, multiple definitions were uh, came around. Initially, there were around 35 definitions. And then major was initially rifle in adults and P-rifle in pediatric. And then akin and finally the Kedigula, Kedigo classification. Currently, most followed classification for both pediatric as well as adult is Kedigo classification. Though they say ki, uh, P-rifle criteria might have uh, better sensitivity, but for, but for generalization, Kedigo classification is preferred. So what does, what does it tell us? that if there is an increase in creatinine of at least 0.3 within 48 hours, or, or there is an increase in creatinine by 1.5 times from the baseline over a period of seven days, or the urine output criteria of decrease urine output below 0.5 ml per kg per hour for six hours. So this will give a diagnosis of AKI. This is the KDO recommendation. This is just uh, what I discussed right now. Uh, so then the staging of AKI by the, uh, again, by the KDGO, which is uh, followed nowadays. So uh, until, uh, two, until two times rise, it is stage one. Two to 2.9 times rise will be stage three. Or if it is beyond three times rise, or the absolute value is above four, um, except in neonates. And if there is a need of renal replacement therapy, and in the pediatric patient that is, that is an 18-year-old, EGFR below 35 ml will also be called as AKI stage 3. Based on urine output, if output is below 0.5 ml per kg for at least 6 hours, it will be stage 1. If it lasts for at least 12 hours, it will be stage 2. If the output is below 0.3 ml per kg for at least 24 hours, or if there is, or if there is anuria for 12 hours, it will be stage 3. So AKI could, uh, could be a hospital acquired AKI or a community acquired AKI. So basically community acquired AKI is when patient comes with AKI or develop AKI within 48 hours of admission. Majority of the cases of AKI in Western world is hospital acquired AKI, even in pediatric population. While majority of the patients who develop AKI in our country or the developing countries are community acquired AKI up to 80%. Though um, most of the um, hospital acquired AKI are multifactorial, while community acquired AKI are single etiology AKI. Um, so most common causes, uh, so if one uh, can enumerate um, sepsis, uh, tropical infections, dehydration, nephrotoxic drugs, and obstructive causes. One can classify as pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. So, uh, but the etiologies which are most com more common are like sepsis, malaria, dengue, dehydration, nephrotoxic drugs. 
कार्डियक सर्जरीज एंड मल्टीपल मल्टीपल मल्टीफेक्टोरियल ए के आईज ऑल्सो कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटिंग टू ए के आई इन पेडियाट्रिक्स नाउ डेज विद ग्रोथ ऑफ मल्टी स्पेशलिटी केयर बट दिस डेफिनेशन एंड क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ ए के आई डजेंट टेल यू वट इज द कॉज ऑफ ए के आई बिकॉज इट हैज इम्पॉर्टेंट प्रोनोस्टिक सिग्निफिकेंस सो ऑलवेज ट्राई टू फाइंड द कॉज ऑफ ए के आई बिकॉज इट्स अ सिंड्रोम एंड नॉट अ डिजीज इट सेल्फ एंड इट्स कॉज अफेक्ट इट्स मैनेजमेंट so whenever you get a case of acute kidney injury in a patient so first of all we have to see is there a ki or not so if it there is there is uh, no a ki one has to monitor continuously if, uh, continuously if the risk is still present uh, all the all those patients who are at increased risk and if there is a risk if there is a ki then you document and stage the a ki and rule out pre renal and post renal causes in pre renal you want to rule out fluid depletion and poor cardiac function and in post renal you want to rule out obstruction and if one get a specific etiology then one can start the management according to that or there can be a non specific ek when there were etiology could not be established so a case scenario uh, this is a most common case scenario uh, in a developing country like ours where especially in the rural area where a, so four four month old child the child is well growing on formula feeds now this child had uh, watery stools for two days and uh, they were not they were not improving on examination child is lethargic and severely dehydrated so the most common um, cause of aki in our scenario is this scenario only and one has to assess when the patient is uh, being assessed for dehydration that is she at risk of aki or not so this is the most common risk as well as uh, for pre renal as well as ischemic renal injury if the pre renal injury continues it will lead to ischemic renal injury but the prognosis is relatively much better in comparison to a patient of sepsis aki because it can be reversed by fluid replacement so one should not be uh, you know uh, one, should, one should not just think that uh, if there is aki the mortality or uh, morbidity will be similar in all the causes cause will affect the outcome and even if the oligouric aki is not prevented recovery within 1 to 2 weeks is mostly um, it's common and um, one just need to support till that point of time with dialysis treatment and so if the patient is um, the question with the question which comes to everybody's mind is how frequently i should monitor my patient who is at risk of aki this is a similar patient or a sepsis patient or a malaria patient so there is no straight forward guideline but if the patient continues to be at risk one can continue to monitor so at least once a day renal function evaluation is acceptable but if our patient is uh, suppose having good urine output and has responded to our management we might just stop further monitoring and but if the patient is having uh, worsening uh, or you are unable to measure urine output the patient might require a frequent monitoring one has to go with this dictum that normal urine output doesn't mean normal kidney function because especially neonates they might have uh, normal urine it's the most common aki is non oligouric aki but low urine output means that there is some abnormality in the kidney function and needs evaluation so what can what all we can do to prevent a aki in a patient who is at risk so most important is assessing the volume status what is the perfusion pressure do it is easier to say it but it is difficult to do especially in the setting of sepsis our clinical features are they are the backbone and the cornerstone but they are late one can use uh, multiple modalities including infrared vena cava by ultrasound cvp cvp analysis but they are all static measurements one can use dynamic measurements like echocardiography uh, pulse pressure variation uh, and also uh, lung comet sign in uh, uh, usg so these these factors can help you understand the intravascular volume uh, status um, fena fena is helpful in differentiating uh, aki uh, from pre um, pre renal and uh, uh, renal but it is affected by uh, drugs like diuretics by volume uh, fluid therapy and under underlying ckd in case of uh, uh, drugs like diuretics instead of fena one can actually use uh, fractional excision of urea uh, 
if freshness is of urea is more than 35%, it suggests that it is um, already renal. And uh, less than 35% suggests it's pre-renal. Um, if the patient is uh, stable hemodynamically and he's still oliguric, one can try a fluid challenge. Um, most of the patients who will land up to you might have already received some fluid challenge. So one has to review the records before again giving a fluid challenge and um, leading to uh, fluid overload. So one should be very cautious while challenging the fluid. Uh, some might, someone, someone before you might have already done that and, and rule out obstruction. And if oliguria persists, then need not push more fluid if the patient is hemodynamically stable. Put him on uh, um, restricted fluids, that is insensible losses and urine output. There is no role of giving diuretics until there is feature of volume overload. Uh, here, I would like to add the role of diuretic is only for assessing the severity of AKI. It's like a pronostic marker that, that is furosemide challenge test, which can tell you will the patient will go into stage 3 AKI or not, and not, in, not, not for therapeutic purposes. And there is no role of low dose uh, dopamine or any other vasodilators. So, in critically ill children, so uh, there is dilemma that one should actually resuscitate for adequate cardiac output and uh, at what level, uh, at till what level they should uh, do the fluid resuscitation. And it is really relatively difficult, especially in patients with uh, sepsis. But uh, dictum is that one should use early goal directed therapy. That is resuscitate early, resuscitate hard, and then keep them dry, restrict their maintenance fluid, and only resuscitate whenever there is need. Otherwise, restrict the maintenance fluid. So uh, that will um, probably give, the, give them um, adequate um, uh, renal perfusion and they will avoid any volume overload. In pediatrics spe specifically, there is uh, evidence uh, in form of percentage volume overload. It is the index of severity and is uh, associated with increased morbidity and mortality and length of stay. Um, this is a very beautiful diagram which suggests the therapeutic window which get narrows as the severity of AKI worsens. This therapeutic window is very wide when the person is actually having a normal appearing renal function and is a high risk. It is still very wide when the patient is uh, having a volume responsive AKI. At this point of time, your traditional biomarkers will be uh, normal. Um, and the new biomarkers uh, which have come up, which we'll be discussing, will be um, abnormal, but they are not in the routine, routine use. And the point when our traditional biomarkers are available, uh, already it's uh, you know too late, but still we have to. So at this stage, mostly uh, we detect our uh, patients with uh, AKI. So we need better, better biomarkers. Uh, this is a uh, diagram which suggests that whenever there will be volume overload, so there will be raised venous pressure and interstitial renal edema, intra-abdominal pressure will, be, will rise and will de decrease the glomerular uh, filtration and uh, there will be diuretic resistance. And if it continues, there will be worsening of AKI. So both volume depletion as well as fluid overload will worsen the AKI. So one has to balance this. And this question is commonly um, encountered in daily practice that will my colloid will help better than crystalloid for resuscitation? So evidence doesn't sub support, though theoretically albumin is a superior volume expander, but it is not more effective than isotonic saline and there is no renal benefit according to the um, um, studies. Uh, theoretically, it can also cause decreased GFR by increasing the oncotic pressure. While hydroxyethyl starch is definitely more uh, nephrotoxic because it can cause osmotic nephrosis and disturbing the proximal tubular function. Uh, so definitely the patient is having um, sepsis and shock, they will require vasopressors and correcting the uh, blood pressure uh, by using vasopressors in a fluid non-responsive state will actually decrease the risk of AKI and AKI severity. None is better than other in preventing, but dopamine has higher risk of arrhythmia and uh, norepinephrine and vasopressin are relatively less arrhythmogenic. There is no role of vasodilator as we previously discussed. 
so what else we can do to prevent it so now we have already seen what all we can do to prevent it but if we can't prevent we have to avoid a second renal injury so this we can do by uh, discontinuing any nephrotoxic medications whenever it is possible and changing it to a non nephrotoxic substitutes like avoiding amino glycosides nsaids mostly um, ace and um, uh, ate1 antagonists are in patients of ckd uh, so uh, one has to discontinue them uh, plain amphotericin b uh, and radio contrast but one has to get the message correct that if they are required for any life saving uh, procedure or therapy they will um, one has to give them but uh, not at the risk of life one should hold them so the same patient tanya was given fluid resuscitation for her severe dehy dehydration but she continued to be oliguric uh, she also have uh, fever so now does she have aki will come into our mind probably she has should we give fluid or not so we know we have already discussed she have received her volume resuscitation she, she is stable one can try a fluid challenge otherwise one should not and restrict her fluids is there to any role not for therapy but can uh, diagnose not but for diagnostic purposes is it uh, or prognostic purposes that will it develop into aki stage 3 or not and dopamine has no role and we have to investigate her for staging of aki and etiology of aki so again diagnosis is by kd go criteria um, in some in some cases creatinine might rise late and uh, especially in the acute kidney in injury setting and urine output criteria is the only one which is available uh, at some point of time because creatinine takes times to accumulate fluid resuscitation dilutes it and sepsis decreases its generation there are new biomarkers like uh, cystatin c kim1 amgal il18 and there are um, others like micro rna which can early predict uh, which can do uh, prediction of aki very early but they are not in the Uh, uh routine use so uh, people have come up with uh, indexes like renal angina index it's for risk prediction not for diagnosis which can uh, predict the risk of aki in a icu setting within first 12 hours uh, one can also people have also tried every four hourly creatinine clearance and they have found it is superior uh, to a single creatinine value so they will do a four hour creatinine creatinine clearance and um, see the trend so if it is decreasing it will give a better estimate of acute kidney injury recently acute dialysis quality initiative has given a diag- um, classification of aki based on biomarkers so this is a recent development um, where they have classified aki into um, which is um, biomarker positive and creatinine is increased so it is aki stage 1b Uh, or biomarker negative uh, and creatinine is increased so it's a functional aki or a subclinical aki where biomarker is positive but creatinine is normal so this will be missed in our clinical uh, day to day practice but it has been shown that it also increases the risk of sick development of ckd at least three folds in uh, some studies um uh, i would like to highlight this also uh, our most common available gfr marker that is creatinine uh, it has various flaws in its estimation uh, it continue to be the most common marker just because its uh, testing is very cost effective the most common test which is done is modified jaffe kinetics uh, it has been standardized by using idms traceable equations it has been standardized so if a lab gives you this idm is traceable modified jaffe kinetic reaction and then gives you a result it is reliable it's a standard lab if it doesn't give you it might be a non standardized lab and this might just create a uh, difference in creatinine and you might diagnose or falsely diagnose aki or unable to diagnose aki because the two values were um, not from the same standard so uh, people have developed pediatric reference range for creatinine concentration so that they can diagnose aki easily specifically for the uh, uh, because like adults have a reference range this reference range is for a, for age wise uh, 
um so one can go through this uh, at different age one can have a different threshold for 95th uh, and 9 and 2.5th centile uh, of creatinine uh so uh, these are various situations where creatinine trend can help us in diagnosing aka so like in case 1 both criteria that is more than 50% rise as well as creatinine rise of more than 0.3 over 48 hours diagnose aka while in second case there is no 50% rise from baseline over a period of 7 days but the absolute rise from day 1 to day 3 is 0.3 so it's give us a diagnosis of aka uh in third case there is no point 3 rise but uh, 50% rise is from baseline so uh, similarly it is uh, from category criteria one it is aki so uh, similar to that we can have various uh, algorithms uh, but sometime we don't have a baseline creatinine so in these cases uh, these are mostly r scenario where a community acquired aki so here a retrospective fall in creatinine will also tell us the uh, will also diagnose our aki which will not be diagnosed by a 0.3 rise in creatinine so uh, management so my management will uh, be uh, can be divided into need of dialysis and non dialytic management so in non dialytic management is fluid management which we already discussed uh, fluid uh, will be based on her, the urine output and insensible losses uh, in neonates especially weight recording is uh, much more easier than urine output recording and input output recording obviously then uh, management of uh, potassium restrict restriction and uh, ecg monitoring electrolyte monitoring acidosis correction and monitoring for the signs of uremia and volume overload um so hyperkalemia we all know how to uh, manage uh, so uh, especially in the setting of aki one should be very um, cautious about monitoring and restricting potassium uh, blood transfusion can also lead to volume as well as hyperkalemia so one should be cautious clinically they don't have much signs and uh, but one can have miss beats bradycardia and hypotension so one should do, do a ecg suppose a child uh, comes with uh, aki so one should do a ecg uh, until potassium report is available so it's a high risk setting one should do and see for the changes of hyperkalemia and if they are there in the ecg one should give a uh, calcium gluconate which will stabilize the membrane without decreasing the potassium decreasing the risk of cardiac complication Medi management Uh, which by transcellular shift will decrease extracellular potassium includes insulin dextrose soda bicarb and beta agonists uh, one can use uh, diuretics to increase the renal excretion of potassium or one can use potassium binding resins and best way to remove potassium if required if it is refractory order management will be uh, dialysis these are various uh, uh, ecg complications which can happen first will be um, tenting of t waves prolongation of pr then loss of p wave qrs prolongation then st segment elevation ectopic beats and scape rhythms and then sine wave pattern so uh, and then drug dose modification is also required for those drugs which are renally excreted so um, but how to dose them so this is tricky but when if available one should one should do a, um, a drug level mostly it is not available so one can actually uh, do a kinetic gfr but it is not standardized and it's difficult to um, standardize and calculate based on egfr is the most common method but it is not reliable and it is not proven for acute kidney injury it is for chronic kidney uh, disease stage Uh, one can assume that if aki stage 3 is there then gfr is probably less than 10 and that should be the drug dosing um, one should try to give those medications which does not require modification hepatic excretion drugs so that will be more beneficial uh, this is the least cared part um, in the acute kidney injury uh, acute kidney injury is a hypermetabolic state now you want to give uh, this uh, this uh, child uh, in a in a hypercatabolic state a uh, good amount of protein and calorie so protein up to 2 to 3 grams per kg per day and uh, calories of around non protein calories of around say 42 uh, 65 kilo calorie per kg per day but your restriction is fluid because the patient is on fluid restriction you can't give this much of um, um, nutrition so 
this actually becomes an indication for renal replacement therapy because when uh, if one has to provide this much nutrition and balance fluid also specifically when they are on liquid feeds and uh, tpn uh, to balance euvolemia one might need to do ultra filtration uh, so that one have one can provide good nutrition so when to give renal replacement therapy so absolute indications they are um, classically um, refractory hyperkalemia metabolic acidosis overt volume overload uh, uremic encephalopathy in chronic cases there is pericarditis acutely rarely um, so there is a concept which is coming come up as uh, renal support uh, instead of renal replacement and especially in the uh, pediatric population a percentage fluid overload of more than 20% that is fluid input till the point Uh, of that day since admission and fluid output till uh, till that point divided by body weight it will this will give you a percentage volume overload and if it is more than 20% absolute it's a indication for renal replacement therapy renal uh, and less more than 10% is like a relative indication i would like to emphasize again that there is no single value of blood urea nitrogen or creatinine that can predict the need of renal replacement therapy and neither there is any cut off which needs renal replacement therapy so um, apart from uh, the classical indications there are other factors which influence uh, the need of dialysis uh, like uh, severity of underlying disease if we are dealing with a glomerular disease which is worsening um, so when no the patient is going to need renal replacement therapy for long or uh, how what are the other organs which are affected like for example there is fluid overload lungs are uh, already bad so one need to uh, give a replacement early uh, also uh, expecting solute burden especially like uh, uh, disease like tumor lysis syndrome and uh, rhabdomyolysis where the solute load can be high and one might require dialysis even twice a day and then again nutrition and drug therapy so which modality choose uh, to to choose so uh, it will depend upon the resources expertise patient and disease char- disease characteristics uh, so if a neonate is there so most common modality of dialysis will be peritoneal dialysis though one can uh, with the current uh, um, uh, armamentoriums one can do a variety of uh, uh, hemodialysis peritoneal uh, uh, or continuous renal replacement therapy or uh, prolonged intermittent uh, therapy but based on patient characteristics the modality will different and disease characteristic also like um, uh, if the patient is hypercatabolic then uh, one might not be able to do a peritoneal dialysis if the patient is having uh, tumor lysis syndrome uh, uh, hd will be better than peritoneal dialysis in a case of uh, severe uh, refractory hyperkalemia hd will be better than a peritoneal dialysis if the patient is in uh, hypovolemia hd is Can, cannot be done and then one has to either choose between crrt or uh, peritoneal dialysis so there will always be a um, uh, trade off between what we can offer and what patient can or a disease uh, demands uh, just want to highlight uh, community acquired aki so it is less studied than the uh, hospital acquired aki all the definitions have come from hospital acquired aki but this is much more common especially in our scenario in the global snapshot uh, done by isn uh, 80% was community acquired uh, and this was even when the rural areas were ill represented so uh, one has to um, um, with, with in the uh, since then there are many studies which have actually looked into this and probably um, prognosis in community acquired aki is relatively better than hospital acquired aki uh, the reason being patients are mostly having a single etiology and they are mostly young patients uh but along with that one has to mention that because uh, especially young patients and children they have a several decades of life expectancy so there is a increased risk of ckd lifetime risk uh, after aki uh, and it needs monitoring isn uh, 0 by 25 is basically to prevent the mortality associated with preventive aki by 2025 um 
so next we come to then uh, how to follow up these patients so are they at increased risk of ckd as we already discussed they are in increased risk of ckd and this ckd risk increases with the increase in severity of aki and the lifetime uh, what is the lifetime uh, forward for that patient for example a child has a long life to live so the risk of ckd will be higher so uh, how frequently one should follow up when to evaluate and how to prevent so one should um, once the aki is resolved one can actually mono follow up them every 3 monthly one should monitor their uh, creatinine proteinuria one can look for their growth of uh, kidneys renal growth um, and there are currently uh, modalities like anti proteinuric agents uh drugs which decreases hyperfiltration like sgl2 inhibitors tight bp control and um and counseling to avoid nephrotoxic drugs uh, these can all modalities which can prevent the progression or slow the progression of ckd so one need to follow up them closely because in adult uh, many studies uh, approximately 50% of ckd was shown to be without any etiology was it a missed aki subclinical aki so probably a lot of patients might have had aki which was missed and when to suspect a glomerular disease so uh, this is actually quite uh, straightforward but sometimes difficult so if there is uh, gross or microscopic uh, hematuria new onset edema as the disease begins and hypertension or a systemic symptoms of connective tissue disorder and without any clear history uh, of volume loss drugs or trigger so one should suspect a glomerular disease or a uh, interstitial disease a uh, few slides on neonatal aki so they are uh, all all newborns are born with the immature kidneys and the gfr which is the adult level by approximately 2 years um at birth the creatinine is a reflection of maternal creatinine and it is it slowly declines over a period of week or in preterms even up to 2 to 4 weeks to reach a another value so neonatal aki is usually non oliguric and oliguria is not a sensitive marker for aki physiological they um, there is a state of polyuria and they lose around approximately 10% weight so um, there is no um, um, well um, uh, well um, developed classification of aki in neonates though one has uh, the community has now accepted more or less the kd ko classification but it still needs further improvement because the classification is mainly based on rising creatinine this is the n rifle uh, which actually uh, has not given any um, uh, value for creatinine because of the uncertain thresholds and is mainly based on urine output but as we already discussed urine output is mostly preserved in uh, neonatal aki um, this is the kdgo classification of uh, aki in neonates the points which are different in neonatal aki in comparison to any other uh, than the standard pediatric and adult uh, classification is that the um, reference creatinine that is the lowest creatinine is uh, is variable so it uh, it is the lowest previous value because uh, creatinine neither is being raised and then there is a rise in creatinine also uh, a creatinine of 2.5 corresponds to a gfr of less than 10 uh, instead of 4 which is in the Uh, uh, adults or pediatric uh, classification of uh, aki urine output criteria they have kept same uh, but studies on urine output is difficult and uh, the largest uh, um, cohort study that is the wiken trial in neonates wiken study it also used 24 hour collection of urine so um, it's uh, difficult so weight monitoring and urine output over a 24 hour is a uh, better or a um, trade off when one can uh, do a monitoring at 24 hours risk factors will be again um, abgar score is low and it is uh, hypoxia low birth weight and preterm children uh, drugs like ibuprofen therapy and neonatal sepsis so um, again management basic principles will remain same uh, only thing is that most common modality will remain peritoneal dialysis and uh, Uh, pd catheters can vary according to the child so a neonate uh, um, um, which is a, a preterm neonate might 
even uh, a normal uh, small pd catheter might be a big enough and they might be dialyzed even with a large bore cannula so one has to um, uh, understand that there are um, the aki itself is a independent risk factor for mortality as well as prolonged stay uh, even in the neonates uh, with uh, advancement in technology so there is hd uh, there is uh, hf20 crrt nidus um, so all these uh, armamentoriums have actually uh, helped us in managing neonatal aki apart from peritoneal dialysis which is done uh, which was which is done um, mainly in the developing countries so developed countries also in neonatal aki is doing mainly peritoneal dialysis so this is a um, nidus system Uh, just to mention that um, prophylactic theophylline uh, post asphyxia uh, was being uh, studied and it has uh, shown that it can prevent aki uh, pro- um, basic mechanism is probably by uh, inhibiting the uh, tubular glomerular uh, feedback the recently uh, caffeine also uh, in the analysis by uh, wiken group has shown that it probably by the same mechanism Uh, decrease the risk of uh, aki uh, in their cohort so, but uh, um, specifically theo 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 the for theophylline that uh, what is the long term neurological outcomes unclear and with the current uh, therapeutic uh, hypothermia um, its place is uh, unclear though kidigo recommended in 2012 the week recommendation it was a week recommendation but uh, um, current era it's probably not of much uh, interest and use uh, thank you very much um,